Uh, hello everybody, my name is Anais and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what is exciting right now for me coming up for the next decade, which is, which is Ruben in the time domain. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I usually work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the traditional owners of where we are, the Wunurong people. So what is time domain in this presentation? So time domain comprises three main categories in my head. The first one is things that are uh, stars like our variable, for example, periodic variations or very regular ones. It could be what we call transients, which are um, things that bri shine brightly and then fade away over a couple of weeks, some months, some days, depending on the time scale you're interested. Or it could be simply solar system objects passing by that we take an image, we detect it, it's bright and then fades away or even satellites because they appear in astronomical images. So for me as an optical astronomer, these are the things that I call time domain. Um, I think what is very exciting right now is that we're going to have a new optical survey scanning the whole southern sky. So Vera C. Rubin studied galaxy dynamics, um, had a spectra from these galaxies, actually was her research was one of the big things that determined that we needed dark matter. Uh, and now we have an observatory to her name. It's the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. It's in Chile. It's almost ready. Um, and you can see the dome here um, to the left. It's really beautiful on the top of the, of the summit. It has, uh, it's a telescope of 6.7 meter equivalent, which for optical astronomers, that's huge. It has the world's largest CCD camera, basically imaging the southern sky with a very large field of view. So we're talking about each time it takes an image is around 40 full moons. And it's imaging the southern, well, will be imaging the southern sky in a really broad uh, wavelengths from uh, 300 to 1,000 nanometers in different um, photometric bands. Now, for 10 years, this telescope will be used absolutely and uniquely for LSST, the Large Survey of Space and Time. So basically, every night for the next 10 years, starting 2024, we will be taking images of the southern sky. So there are different fields, so you can see them here. Um, this is not the final observing strategy, but it's very close to what we expect to have. But we expect to have thousands of visits over the 10 years in these green um, fields, hundreds of visits in the purple. And if you have very, very good eyes, you can see some yellow ones here, which are deeper uh, fields that we will drill every couple of days. So basically, we will have a super video of the southern sky in digital. We don't have that right now. So this is amazing for everything that is changing in the sky. Now, how deep it is? Not only is a wide field, but it's also very, very deep. So we're talking about a survey like SDSS, Sky Mapper, or something like that, um, going to this type of quality. We're talking 25 Mac in R in a single exposure. We're talking 30 second exposures. So if you work with optical data, this is amazing. Of course, there will be stacks being done and data releases with the stacks. But because I work with time domain science, the stacks are less interesting usually because I don't want to stack everything that has happened in 10 years. Um, there are different data products in LSST. So there is, of course, the raw data. You have a different image analysis that I'll tell you about. And then you have, for example, within 24 hours, there will be automatically catalogs of objects, of a cross match with um, solar system bodies, etc. And then there will be annual, annual data releases. So if you want access to the proprietary data, you need to be part of LSST. For that, if you're interested, the PI that is leading that is Sarah Brown in UNSW. But there is something that is absolutely public from the seconds that is taken and processed. Is this one, the difference image uh, product. So I'm going to talk only about this. If you want to talk about proprietary data and how this interacts with what I'm presenting today, more than happy to do that. But right now, I'm going to talk about public data and public data only. So what is this difference image analysis? Basically, if you haven't worked with transients or variable stars astronomy, what we do is we take an image, for example, last night, we compare it to an old image. We basically make a difference in a smart dish way. 
and we have a difference and we monitor the brightness evolution of this object that should be a circular source if everything is on right and you monitor over time. So this is a light curve. This will be what I'll be talking about the whole seminar basically is the evolution of the observed luminosity over time in different band passes or colors or filters that you see here. So for Rubin we expect every night for 10 years to detect up to 10 million time domain candidates. Probably it will be more than 100,000 big ones, but um, every 37 seconds, ev every couple of minutes. So it will be around, I don't know, 5 millions or something like that, because we have seen that uh, what they promise is usually an upper bound. But still we need to think about 10 million transient candidates for 10 years every night. How do you deal with this data? You cannot copy this here. No way. This is not going to happen. You are not going to be able to do your copy database, open your CSV, and do whatever you want. Now, each detection will contain this information, the thumbnails of the um, images, and the light curve, plus a history up to one year for the same coordinate, plus some um, correlational information like if it's near a galaxy or uh, cross matches with catalogs maybe. We're still negotiating that. Now when Ruben started to see uh, all these uh, data volumes they made a call for brokers. Basically the idea of brokers will be infrastructures that will receive these 10 million alerts per night in real time so every 37 seconds we get a bunch of data and we will process it enrich it with information from other catalogs, machine learning classifiers, etc. Filter it out to disentangle which are the science cases that you're interested. Maybe you're interested in asteroids, maybe you're interested in variable stars, maybe you're interested in kilonova. And you will redistribute it, whether it's for follow-up or for just doing science. So imagine every 37 seconds, 100,000 transient detections. And they made this call. And one of the brokers that got selected around the world, we were seven, uh, only five of us are actually processing data right now, is Fink. So this is uh, my flagship project. It's something that I started with Julian Peloton and Emily Shida in 2019 when they made this call. Uh, Julian is our infrastructure lead, so he's an engineer. So Fink is built for Rubin um, using big data technology. So we're talking distributing computing, uh, things that I will never understand because that's why engineers do their work and I do <laughs> my science work. Uh, we have been selected to receive the real um, stream, a real time stream of data for the 10 years of LSST. So we have a vouch of confidence there. And we have received funding to deploy FINK in CCI and de Petroit, uh, which sounds very French because it's in France. It's a computing center in France where also part of the data of LSST will be processed. Now, of course, Fink is not French only, uh, their components are in France, but what we want is to have a very broad science collaboration with people around the world. It's open to anyone. You don't, because we work with public data, everything we do is public, our source code is public, if you are willing to learn how that works. Uh, it's open to everyone, uh, and you can join us uh, to have fun, to learn about big data technologies, but also do your science and prepare for Ruben. Now, um, this is a couple of pictures of some of the events we did in the last couple of years. Um, of course, there is much more people that couldn't attend, but you can see that it's a community that is starting to build up and we're trying to do some science results that I'm gonna show you today. So today I'm gonna tell you about three surveys. So the Rubin Observatory, because that's what we're working towards, very deep, are 25 magnitudes in a single exposure, all southern hemisphere, but it will start next year. But meanwhile, we can use data from other surveys to test FINK, but also to test different components like classifiers, etc. So I'm gonna talk to you about the SWIKI transient facility. Imagine SWIKI as something shallower in the northern hemisphere, like a prototype of Rubin. And I'm going to talk about the dark energy survey that uh, the goal is to do cosmology, it's already finished, but I have tried a lot of my machine learning classifiers in that data set because cosmology standards are very tough to match. It's like you really want the best quality classification of the objects. So I want to show you how good we can do here. Also, it's quite deep. 
a little bit equivalent to what we can see with Ruben. So let's start with CTF. Basically, these are the alerts of CTF. If you're uh, worried that this doesn't look like the north, it depends how you do the projection. This is what the Planck people use as projections, but that's the northern hemisphere with a band in the south. So it's detecting up to one million uh, candidates every night, so an order of magnitude less than Rubin. And these are real images of a variable star, a supernova, and an asteroid. They just pass away. So this is the data we're working with. So the beautiful Hubble images, that's not what we're looking, <laughs> working with. We're working with this type of data, which is very rich, and we can do a lot of things. So we have processed 100, 100 million alerts since 2019. And then we're going to show you a little bit how it works. Basically, when you have such a data volume, the first thing that you do is to put some very low quality cuts, basically avoiding artifacts. Sometimes that difference images don't work very well, so you get artifacts. But then the first thing you do is you do cross-match positional with catalogs. So you have a coordinate of the object and you say, oh, has this been detected in this survey, in Panster? Has this been detected in SDSS, etc." We have uh, a link with CDS. So this is the people that host um, uh, Simbat, for example. And the idea is that you can know whether this object is a variable star, whether it is nearby a galaxy, or maybe you don't know anything about it. All this information is useful. Now, all this alert as well can be cross-matched with survey streams. So imagine the gravitational wave footprints of LIGO Virgo Cagra, uh, VOE events, GCN notices, anything that you can think that you want to work with. Then you can enrich this information as well with like saying, oh, is this object rising in luminosity, fading away, is it blue? Maybe the probability of it being a kilonova is high or low or an asteroid. So we have all these that I will tell you a little bit more about, especially the machine learning classification part. And then you say, well, I want objects that are blue rising near a galaxy. And then you can access it. So we have two main ways of accessing it. The first one is a real-time API. Basically, it's a programmatically efficient way of sending these things directly to um, your telescope to trigger follow-up. For example, if this thing is fading away and it's like, oh, it looks like a kilonova, the second in the world to be spectroscopically confirmed, let's trigger the telescope. You can do this within minutes of it being observed by CTF, Rubin, whatever we're processing. So that's pretty fast. And the other way around is to go through our database, which is our science portal. We have a web interface I'll show you. And we have a REST API, which is a fancy way of saying you can go to your terminal, Jupyter Notebook, Python, and access the database from your computer. Now, you cannot download the whole database because, again, 100 millions just for CTF, that is the precursor. Um, but there are ways of downloading data that I can tell you about as well. Now, the whole idea is that with CTF, we have been processing since 2019. And from all these alerts, we make like substreams of different things, like variable stars, early type 1a can supernova candidates, solar system objects, etc. This is published. It's not perfect. You can see here some things that shouldn't be there. We have improved this since then, but it's to give you an idea of the power of Think, even with very early processing. Now, Going back a little bit, I want to tell you about classification. Why is it important? Why is it hard? Because I'm telling you all this like everything can be done, but it's actually not that easy. So type 1a supernova is an object that has interested me for a long time. I am a cosmologist by formation, so I have been using type 1a supernova to study how the universe is becoming bigger. So these are very bright exploding stars like this one that can outshine millions of stars in a galaxy, which means with a magnitude depth of 24.5, we can go to redshift 1.3 uh, for this type 1a supernova, depending how you process. What's interesting about finding type 1a supernova is that they are standard candles. They're objects that we know, kind of, how bright they shine when they explode. Uh, so we can use them to measure distances. So that way we can measure how the universe is becoming uh, bigger, measuring distances and then redshifts. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the results that we did with the Dark Energy Survey, which 
our goal is to have a direct measurement of how the universe is becoming bigger. Now I showed you the images of CTF. I am showing you now an image of DCAM. This is, uh, uh, DCAM is in the Blanco Telescope in Chile. So this is a beautiful uh, galaxy close by NGC something, which I never remember, it's down there. But we're not searching supernova here, very close by. We're searching supernova actually far away in this galaxy that is appearing in the center. You can see the bulge, and then now you're seeing the supernova. And this is the type 1A supernova that exploded. This is the data that we're using. Of course, there is no color in our images. We have only the band passes, but the idea is the following. You get some pixels with this brightness evolution, and this is how we get light curves. Brightness evolution of this object over time in different filters or different colors. Now, supernova is not only type 1A supernova. If you have worked with a lot of people here <laughs> that I can see in the crowd, there are other types of supernova, like core collapse, weird things. We don't use them for cosmology. So we want to determine whether this is a type 1A supernova or not, because that's the ones that we use for cosmology. So usually what we do, we follow them up spectroscopically, get a spectra around the maximum light. We get the spectra, we're happy, we can determine whether it's a type 1A or not. So OSDIS was the biggest provider of the spectra for the dark energy survey. Um, we actually had uh, more than 100 nights at the AAT for six years, which is a lot of time and a lot of fun. Uh, I love AAT and 2DF Omega. It's a beautiful instrument, although a little bit old now. And basically what we did is we took real-time supernova spectra for typing and also getting redshifts from that uh, supernova. But actually for cosmology, you really want that the redshift is really, really, really well measured. So what we do is we target the host galaxy mostly to get the redshift because you have more emission and absorption signs basically and you can get um, better. And what we did was like um, stacking spectra, like you stack images, you can stack spectra and we can get up to magnitude 24 in R to get those galaxies. If that doesn't sound amazing for you, I'm sorry because it is amazing. AAT going this deep, it's incredible. Um, and we're very happy about these results. Now, how we did cosmology for, so the dark energy survey is five years. The first three years we processed them, did some analysis, and I, I'm gonna show you how we did it. We basically took a spectra of the supernova candidates. We have 300,000 supernova candidates to start. We ended up with 251 type 1A supernova spectroscopically classified. We take distances using the light curves. We take red sheets from the host galaxy. We do cosmology, we're happy. We can do what we call a Hubble diagram, which is basically the distance against redshift for all these little points are type 1A supernova. And this can tell us, this little difference can tell us whether the universe is expanding in an accelerated fashion or not. And this is how we base everything. We compare it to a a cosmological model, we are still Lambda CDM, nothing has changed, but what can we do better for the five year analysis? So, spectroscopic classification. If you have worked with spectra, it's so much fun, but it's also so much pain. Type 1A supernova spectra varies like this through time. So now you need to match these with all these options to a type 1A supernova. Not only that, spectroscopic time is super hard to get. Um, you cannot go as faint uh, and you also need to get the supernova while it's shining because if it fades away it's over you know like I cannot go back in time and the worst thing for cosmologies is that this biases samples and I can tell a whole seminar about how it biases samples because that has been my big part of my work but I'm gonna have the fun part which is how would we do differently use photometrically selected type 1a supernova using only light curves which is what we're going to use as well in the broker. So how do we do that? So before I tell you how do we do it, I'm going to tell you why is it hard. So this looks very beautiful. Oh, look at this beautiful type 1A supernova or not type 1A supernova. I know it's type 1A supernova. So, But the problem is that spectra is very rich with information. You get the absorption, the emission lines, you get like a lot of detail on the supernova. Second thing, telescopes irregular time series. Basically, whether it was cloudy, the scene was bad, I have huge error bars here. 
so that's very hard to actually process, highly regular time series, especially if you want to use machine learning. And you cannot do very simple cuts. We have done them. The contamination is super hard, high on, um, on the sample. So you cannot get a pure type 1a supernova sample, which is what we want for cosmology. So I developed a machine learning framework called Supernova. Uh, it looks beautiful written, but it's very hard to pronounce because nobody knows how to pronounce it. Uh, it's in GitHub if you want to take a look. And the idea is the following. You get the time series, and en any point of the time series, you can actually get a classification, which is great for things like brokers because we are doing this in real time. It handles irregular time series. There, we only use fluxes, errors, and time. If you have extra information, you can use redshifts. Uh, it's non-parametric for people who have done photometric classification. This is important because if you fit something to this time series, it actually biases the sample in many ways that we can talk about if you want. Um, it's based in recurrent neural networks, and we also have Bayesian neural networks, um, which are super interesting because it provides you not only a classification probability, but also an uncertainty. And you can use that to find out if this is an anomaly, uh, to know the trust of your classifier on the probability. And we have found it's quite accurate for simulations, more than 98%, and since then we have been using it in different surveys. Now, of course, cosmology is a very precision thing, and the first thing that we did was, well, let's train it with state-of-the-art simulations. And this was work uh, led by Maria Vincenzi at that time in the UK, but now in the US. Um, she graduated last year. And we did a whole study on the percentage of contamination of core collapse supernova if we classify these samples. Um, the color code is not here, but purple is other classifiers. What you want to see is supernova is the red one here on the bottom. So basically, over a large redshift range, we can get a very, very pure sample. So that's amazing. We're talking about less than 4% contamination, which is very good for us. And it can even be less than 2%, which actually is the contamination of a spectroscopically classified sample. Because I tell you spectroscopy is amazing, but sometimes we are not really sure what we classify with spectra. So then we uh, I applied these to data. And there is a whole paper on this. Uh, and you can see this is a type 1a supernova. You can see the double bump here if you like type 1a supernova. And we um, evaluated with different classifiers. So this is a normal RNN, and these are Bayesian RNNs. I'm not going to talk about this because it's a quite interesting thing, but uh, I want to show you a little bit the power of these in the survey first. So these are the fields of the dark energy survey. So this is um, three fields together, two fields together, three fields together, two fields together. And on the left, you're going to see the sample, like a time lapse of the sample if it, for the spectroscopically confirmed supernova 1A. And on the right, in orange, you're going to see the ones that are photometrically classified. So basically, same data, just one has a spectra and the other one has not a spectra. And you can see how much more supernova 1A we're getting from the same data. So we're really taking advantage of the beauty of um, this um, survey. Not only that, that we have almost a five time increase on the cosmology sample that we're actually doing results right now, but we can probe actually higher redshift ranges. So here is the spectroscopically classified and this is the photometrically classified, both for redshift distribution and the magnitude in I of the peak. If you have worked with biases, this is super important because we're usually biased to get actually very bright objects instead of very faint objects, which makes that the population is not properly probed. And you can see how high we go. So this is great. Uh, and you don't need to take my word for it. A lot of people have thought this is great. Uh, we have been doing a lot of papers understanding the galaxies uh, where these objects live, the population properties. Now there is a fancy thing called dust for type 1a supernova. We're finally digging into how dust from the galaxy influences how we see the supernova and how we standardize it. But we can also do other fun things for the core collapse lovers here. You can get core collapse supernova with the same classifier, just training it differently. And we are doing that. Uh, 
Actually, it's just published in 2023. Now, because I, I showed you a Hubble diagram before, I'm going to show you the preliminary Hubble diagram of the Dark Energy Survey five-year data. If you remember the other one, not that many points, this is super populated. And in these colors, you can see the ones that have very low probability of being a type 1a supernova. You can see that this, all this is not a type 1a supernova. I'm not going to tell you how good the results are because they are still blinded. We are tweaking all the knobs and we will unblind the analysis hopefully this year and you will have the results whether uh, we see something new with the dark energy uh, effect, um, which I would love to say yes, but <laughs> potentially Rubin would be much better for that than DES. But it's good because we're testing all these mechanisms before we go to Rubin. Now, I have shown you how hard it is to do machine learning classification, what we have managed, and how good it is now. Now, let's go back to Fink. And let's go back to how are we preparing for Rubin. So, Fink is right now, um, well, Fink is right now um, processing CTF data. So this is a light curve and you have the QR code if you want to go to this object. This is a light curve of a supernova candidate we recently found. We have supernova scores from Bogo Supernova, another algorithm called, um, that is early type 1A supernova. And we have another one called T2. So we have three different machine learning scores probing different parameter spaces. <coughs> Combining these uh, scores together, we are actually giving up a filter stream with supernova candidates that you can use for your science. If you want to do supernova, it's already done the filter. You just subscribe and you get it. Whether it's like a Slack bot or it's a simply a stream that you want to get, you can get it. We're also getting very early supernova, you know, the ones that only have three, four points, maybe five, six, and trying to figure out whether it could be a type 1A supernova. So what we do is we report them publicly to the IAU um, TNS, the transient name server. Basically, we tell everybody we have a potential type 1A supernova here. We observe it this day with this magnitude. You can follow it up. And from this sample, we had 600 that have been spectroscopically confirmed to be supernova, most type 1a, and only one that was actually a cataclysmic variable. But it's still, it's pretty impressive that even with partial data, just the rising part, we can get this um, thing. I am working a little bit more on the dark energy survey um, classification very early um, to see how it could bias cosmology. That's in prep. Stay tuned if you're interested on that. Now, how are we preparing for Rubin? So I'm telling you about real data, which is always hard, but Rubin is coming up online next year. So what are we doing? Well, we did some simulate. Well, I didn't do. There was a team that created these simulations that is called the Elastic Challenge. Basically simulations not only of supernova, but also of stars. This is an EB star, actually. Uh, this is a supernova 1BC. And you can see the data quality that we expect from Rubin. So a lot of data points, quite shaky. Actually, the simulation was done to be really, really shaky. These are all the times that got simulated from variable stars, AGNs, per instability supernova, supernova, etc. And we're actually doing the analysis with different machine learning algorithms and processing in real time this because we want to test our infrastructure. And this is something that um, our collaborators in Brazil actually are leading, uh, Bernardo Fraga, uh, and you'll see those results in the next month or two. Because I know that you like Kilonova, I said let's tell you a little bit about what we're doing with Kilonova. So Kilonova, neutron star, mergers or neutron star black hole mergers of course producing gravitational waves but also we have one spectroscopically confirmed that had our optical counterpart in different wavelengths as well um, this is part of work that i'm doing with oscraf um, i am also part of oscraf um, and you probably have seen this plot but i always think this is amazing this is from when we found the first kilonova <laughs> What happened, there was a gravitational wave detection in LIGO Virgo, a GRB that you can see uh, very quickly afterwards. And then we started doing the optical follow-up here. So a big time afterwards. 
Um, we got some optical images here in Australia with SkyMapper. So this is a SkyMapper images. I used to work in SkyMapper, so this I'm very proud of this. I used to actually do the pipeline of this. And this is the light curve that we got from Australia, including SkyMapper, SATCO, uh, but also the ANU 2.3 meter where we got the spectrum. Now, kilonova are great. We can study a neutron star equation state. We can study our processes nucleosynthesis. We can also use them for cosmology, which is also great because they give us a new way to study like the local environment, like the Hubble constant. And there are different ways that we can find them. The first one we already did once. Hopefully O4 will give us more. But we get a gravitational wave detection. We search for an electromagnetic counterpart using like uh, images of telescopes and then triggering follow-up and getting our kilonova. However, LIGO, Virgo, Cagra are not online all the time. O4 is coming up. But we can also take another way of finding kilonova is the orphan kilonova searches. So basically you get these surveys, like CTF, you find transients, you determine if it's a kilonova, and then search back if there was a gravitational wave detection, maybe low signal to noise, but maybe there was no gravitational wave detection, but is it a kilonova? And then we can search up, follow up, and figure out whether it could be a kilonova or not. So this table was done when we got the first kilonova, beware. The numbers have changed since then because observing strategies have changed for newer experiments like CTF. But we asked ourselves whether we could have found a kilonova by random chance in one of the surveys we have talked about, like DS, 0 0.26 kilonova. That's not much. But CTF here was supposed to have around 10. Now, this has changed because we changed, well, they changed the observing strategy. But you can imagine that potentially some. There are also searches, for example, I'm part of a program called KNTROP where we use DCAM to actually go over fields to get one kilonova, but that's another thing. But let's say CTF got a kilonova and we have the data. Can we find it? So we took CTF data, we took pink, and we created orphan kilonova searches. One of them is with a machine learning kilonova score developed by uh, Biswajit Biswas, which is already published and filtering known transients. Another one is cross-matching with close-by galaxies, trying to find things that are happening very close by. And another one is just using, like, is this slope looks like a kilonova if all the kilonova are like 17 or 8, 17, which we don't know, but three ways of doing. And what we did was we did a collaboration with Grandma. So this is a network of telescopes around the world. I don't know if you can see the little points, but all these points are telescopes in this network. So basically we send them to them, they follow up, um, and we got some data. We didn't get a kilonova. Nah. Spoiler alert, else I will be here talking about a nature paper that we published. Um, but we did this between April and September 2021. Um, we follow up some objects. Uh, four were asteroids, some were cataclysmic variables, and some were supernova. But these are a little bit the light curves that we get. Uh, and these are the differences between the magnitude um, ranges of each of the filters. So we're actually trying to figure out how we can find this orphan kilonova. Even though we didn't find one, well, cross fingers, we will continue doing this. And maybe we can get an orphan kilonova population that is actually less biased than with gravitational waves because the horizon of gravitational wave detectors is much shallower than what we can do with optical um, telescopes. So I'm going to finish up with something that probably nobody has thought about and nobody's working about, but I find it super cool. Uh, <laughs> satellites. Satellites are found in astronomical images. We say that those tracks that are taking off on surveys. We believe them, but you can have rapid flashes from sunlight reflections of satellites or space debris that look like this. Are they transients like the ones I'm searching for? Nope. What can we do with them? So Sergei Karpov, who is in the uh, Czech Republic, and Julian Peloton did a little work on this and actually processed Sphinx alerts uh, in 2021 and found tracks of 
satellites and then um, try to find the ones that were satellites, the ones that were uh, where they were, geosynchronous orbit or not. So they found with um, cross match with known catalogs 60% without a match 40%. Space debris satellites that haven't been reported to be seen, they are still working on this. Uh, this is hard because doing tracks over images, it's a problem that generates very quickly. It becomes very expensive. And not only for satellites, but also for solar system objects. So Romain Le Montagnier, who is publishing that paper soon, developed an algorithm called FinFAT that is um, doing tracks for asteroids. And they actually follow up some asteroids, um, some potential new ones. I'm not going to spoil the results, but this will be coming next month, probably. Um, but we're also working with other things, microlensing events, um, gamma ray bursts, neutrinos, parent stability supernova, fast transient, finding the most anomalous object that we can find. The thing that we didn't have any idea what could it be as well, also working. We have an interface with Astro Colibri, which is a multi-waveland um, portal. And we also have an interface with the TOM toolkit that you can trigger follow-up in Aeon in, in the telescope site in Chile um, with this toolkit directly with FINK. Of course, this is not exhaustive. We are very horizontal as a collaboration. If you want to join any of these science cases or anything that you have in your head, it's very easy to join. Basically, you agree to a code of conduct and you're part of the FINK collaboration. Now, I'm going to finish up talking about um, this new project that Duncan and a couple of other people here <laughs> are involved. So we got a leaf um, to actually do a robotic network at Siding Spring Observatory. And the idea is the following. We will be able to trigger follow-up automatically and actually reduce the data and communicate it back um, with the ANU 2.3 meter DREAMS, which is an infrared um, telescope, um, Go to South, which is a photometric telescope. And um, all this will be controlled by an alert system, and think will be plugged into this. So if you have time in the telescope and you want to trigger an object, you can do it through think if it was detected by think. Uh, you can ask these people that you probably know more than me here, or more than happy to talk about this and how this connects to think. And to give you a taster of how you can access the data, of course you have the real-time API telescope how you speak telescope, which I don't. Uh, but you can go to the science portal or you can actually do this in a Jupyter notebook. But this is a little video of the science portal. Hopefully it plays. Yes. So you go to thinkportal.org. We have some ways to download data, some statistics, some tutorials on the API. And you can actually search with a cone search, date search. If you're curious, there is a help. Um, you can do here a class search. We're going to search over CTF data. Here are type 1a supernova candidates. I search for them. You have a table where you can actually add columns and filter out things. I'm going to filter something that doesn't change anything, but you can put bigger than 10 detections, for example. You can preview them here. And then you can go directly to the object and have a look. Connection from Australia is low. We're thinking about deploying a mirror here because <laughs> it's hard sometimes. So this is an object. You get some contextual information from other surveys and catalogs. You get the like from, from CTF. All this is public. Um, you get um, the cutouts. You get coordinates where it detected the neighborhood, some information and links. And then we have these profiles. This is a supernova one. So you get like the machine learning classifier scores of the different classifiers some color and magnitude evolution, some information. But we also have other profiles like variable stars, microlensing, solar system. Variable stars, you basically fit periodicity. Microlensing, also a classifier, solar system objects and tracklets you're finding, tracks, basically. So that's how you access data in Think. Um, so today I have told you about amazing things that we can do with a bunch of data. It's very hard to work with very big data volumes, but we are making it easier for you using brokers. Uh, we have built in a state of the art technologies and we have a lot of things going on, but you can join us and actually grow it even bigger. 
And the last slide I'm going to show you is a shameless uh, advertisement, one of a workshop that I'm organizing at Swinburne the first week of May. Um, the 3, 4 and 5 of May is called Ausfink because it's connecting Fink to the Australian community and also New Zealand as well. We have some people coming from New Zealand, which I'm very excited. It's an Oscar support event. And I'm also advertising for a PhD project with machine learning, if you know any students that could be interested. And I am very happy to answer any questions you may have. Audience, the cosmology part using type 1a supernovae, because they are turbulent event and explodes, so there would be some natural variations in the light of the first place. Are you also using the new data to get much more observational data for lo locally to be able to calibrate the remote type 1a? Excellent question. We are right now, we don't have a follow up program for that, but I think that could be an amazing thing to do with a wide field of Rubin because we will have a lot of supernova in the closed volume. The issue is always the balance. If you're going uh, very close, you don't have that many type 1a supernova because volume rates. Um, but with Rubin, we will have enough to do that, so we need to organize a, a follow up for this. Right now, the follow up that is being organized is not for studying inhomogeneities in the explosion of type 1a supernova, but it's something that we can think of. We could select them and then we can trigger follow-up. I was more uh, uh, worried about because there's an, an actual intrinsic spread in the supernova, there are turbulent events and they are all the same. Yes. So I would expect that's it. But I think particularly interesting would be to look at locally that also at some, some uh, low metallicity galaxies that are more type 1a state that are more relevant for high redshift windows. That's Exactly the point that we're trying to do, if I find my slide here, yes, here. So um, we have been testing with red magic galaxies alone because we know that these are quite homogeneous. So we are taking out a factor of the diversity of the host galaxies and that actually works very well. Now with the local volume, we haven't done that. We don't have enough type 1a supernova. I think this will change now, um, but yes, we need, I think, the key on cosmology with type 1a supernova right now is not anymore how many you get, it's how can you characterize the diversity of the type 1a supernova, all the explosion mechanisms that we still don't know, all the environments that we still don't know, to make them very cosmological probes. And I think that's the big challenge that we have with type 1a supernova cosmology right now. And that's why we are talking about dust as well. Everybody forgot about dust at one point. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. No worries. Uh, yeah, very nice talk. Um, uh, I was curious about the the spatial resolution of SSD. So, for example, if like this, this recent many supernovae where they explode twice and things, would you be able to distinguish whether supernova went off twice or if it's just two supernovae in the same galaxy? Well, it depends how far you're looking, of course. Um, I can tell you for DES, we already did that. We have a uh, supernova exploding in the same galaxy and we disentangle them, which has less resolution than Rubin. And these are supernovas that are, I may tell you a lie, but it's a mid redshift range for us, which I, I can search for these. Don't take me for granted around 0 0.6 or something like that. Uh, Maybe I'm saying a lie. We can take a look at the paper because I cannot recall. Um, with Rubin, we will be even better. Um, so the figure that they always say is you can resolve a golf ball from the other side, like in the CBD of Melbourne, from like the Dantenon ranges or something like that. It's kind of that the resolution kind of thing. One day I searched this and I found that was amazing. Like Dantenon ranges to CBD, a golf ball. Wow, mind blowing. So we're talking about this. Uh, I, I don't have those figures redshift wise um, because angular resolution, uh, angular distances, but we can make the math, absolutely. But yes, there will be those type of detections. I, I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, also, like, uh, I was curious if you can do these like, legacy type of things where you can detect the progenitors after the signal. Yes, the core collapse uh, progenitors. Yes, this is an exciting thing. Uh, it would have to be very close by the core collapse supernova. So yes, I think that could work, but yeah, very close by. Um, we can take a look how far. I'm pretty sure we did this. We did a transient and variable star science collaboration roadmap recently, and I think we talked about this. So 
So we can take a look afterwards. Okay. Any more questions? Maybe we will give students a chance. <laughs> Don't be shy. OK? You can think about one more that you will either ask one. Um, so I'm curious about how um, it's best to do training if, let's say, we have some sources for which we don't have that many observations yet, right? So if you have, you know, type many supernova, okay, you know, you have lots of uh, light curves, uh, you can do machine learning, uh, and then, you know, say, look, look for things like one of these other thousands that we observed, right? If I'm interested, in, let's say, luminous red nova, well, maybe there are 10 events, right? And they, there's some diversity between them. Are we better off creating models, theoretical models, for example, and fitting to the models rather than, or looking for things that match the models rather than looking for things that match a small set of light curves, what, 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 what's, sort of what's your recommendation for how to go about that? It depends on the transient or variable that you're searching for. I think there are three ways, actually, not one, not two, okay. three. So, huh. one of them is getting probabilities of classification that gives you uncertainty. So this is like the B Bayesian neural networks idea. So these uncertainties here gives you an uncertainty of how the model is confident on this prediction. So these uncertainties, if the uncertainties are very high, you can find, you can say, oh, at this point, this looks like a type 1a supernova, but not really certain because probably there are other things that could resemble, or probably this doesn't resemble of anything that in the training set it was given, okay? So actually I did a small study on how this could use to find anomalies, like things that haven't been in the training set, and you can get some indications in average, not one by one basis, which is a problem, but again, patient neural networks is kind of a new technology. The second thing is obviously improving your training sets with theoretical models. And that we're doing uh, in particular with the elastic uh, simulations, we're incorporating per instability supernova models um, from Stefan Blondin, some models like from um, Kaysen of like Kilonova and weird thing, things like that. So that's helping us to find other things. Actually, the machine learning classifier of the Kilonova that we use in Pink is trained on theoretical models, not necessarily empirical models because we only have one supernova. That's the second way to do it. And the third way, which I don't have a slide here, but if you're interested, I can show you, is using active learning. So active learning is very interesting. So you get um, your training set, okay? And you can train, and I am gonna move the hands a lot. You have your training set here, and you um, have a pool of objects that you don't know what they are. And you train a classifier to detect from this pool of objects, what would be the object that would you, would you like to get a spectra from it, so you could characterize and inject it to the training set back again. And that way, you can actually improve your training set in a smart way. So we did a study on that, which I can show you the plots about, how fast we can improve the accuracy just targeting things that are a little bit in the borders of the distributions or even out the distribution to improve the training set. And that's an intelligent way of using our scarce spectroscopic time and um, use it for improving the training set. So I guess the three ways are interesting. Uh, very complementary, absolutely complementary, yeah. I think there was a question back there. I was just wondering about the total disruption of that. Yes. You didn't have it in your subcategory list. No. Um, is there a reason why not or is it just plunged into AGN? It's basically we haven't had anybody approaching us saying we want to do tidal disruption events. So that's maybe you. <laughs> Come. It's very easy. Uh, we usually like the whole idea is that you can build the filters and the way of getting the events that interested you. Uh, I cannot, although I love playing with satellites and microlens, I am not an expert on this. So it has to be the experts in the community that move this forward. So yes, please, there is nothing that prevents us from doing tidal disruption events. <laughs> I think there's quite a uh, sizable community about this in Australia. Yes. So in Western Australia, these observations. So I mean, it's in probably should, should be something. I mean, in general, there is within the the LST uh, candidate variable stars group, there is there are certainly people who are who are thinking about TDs. So Sharpen Belson, for example, is is uh, quite actively exploring the observation strategies for TDs and so on. But in your think thing, it would be nice to have a pipeline of things coming up. 
I would love that to happen. Please come, <laughs> join us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. Uh, the, the, the thing you device looks amazing, uh, but I, it, it made me think of the Lasser uh, interface, which I think also has ZTF data. What level are those two sort of complementary or trying to answer different yes. problems? Or? Yes, this is excellent question. So I told you that there are seven brokers chosen by Ruben. So we have in Chile, Alerce, in the US, Antares, Pit Google, and Oh my goodness. Uh, ah, Babamool, sorry. In Europe, we have Lacer, Ampo, Fink. Well, Fink is now in Australia as well because I'm a PI, so uh, Fink is multinational. Um, so, from these, only Alerce, Antares, Fink, Ampo, Lacer are processing CTF data as a precursor to LSST. The difference between all of us is the science community that build it. We have different ways of handling the infrastructure, the databases, um, how you um, filter the objects, okay? Um, we all receive the same data. We make different cuts and it all depends on the community. Uh, that doesn't mean that we fight each other and we don't speak with each other. Actually, Alerce and think we have a huge collaboration on the infrastructure, so we do a lot of distributed computing that is similar and databases structure. Uh, Ampel, Lacer, and think we meet once a month to discuss how to share, actually. Um, Lacer uses our machine learning supernova classification scores in their filtering, and we are gonna receive their host galaxy matches from Sheffield, uh, Sherlock, sorry, Sherlock which is a, an algorithm that they created to find host galaxies. So we're sharing information, but the difference between us is that we have built for different communities. And if you feel more comfortable with one type of interface or the other or the community, um, you can join. You can join all of us if you want. Um, feel free to do that. <laughs> yes, so it, it's a complementary and uh, sometimes overlapping, but uh, we have science cases in think that People don't have in other uh, brokers. Other brokers have science cases that we don't have. Yeah, it's also quite cooperative, which is good. Yes, between. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we think the better we work together, the better the science will be. Actually, um, Alerce and Fink, um, so Francisco and I, we organize, uh, Francisco Foster is the PI of Alerce. We organize a ruling community workshop over COVID two sessions. Um, joining all the brokers, working together towards the science that's gonna happen. Yeah. And we're gonna have a next one maybe at the end of the year, but I am not gonna tell you more about that because it's still not fixed. <laughs> and maybe I can ask one question. Uh, a few moments. Yeah, so you mentioned that you mentioned also in, on, on the peculiar transient side, right? And also, yeah, yeah, so I had a question about that and maybe like, if you have like, you know, Let's say you see a supernova, but you see it's, it's like like like, a, like, a, like an AGM galaxy. So, are you taking account like the different natural correlations between like two or more various things? So, you are talking about Fink or are you talking about cosmology? Uh, not about Fink. Oh. Okay, because in cosmology we throw away all the supernova when they that get contaminated by light of an AGM. So we do that filtering. Um, in Fink, we are not currently exploiting that, but you can actually get already some information because we cross match with catalogs. You can already have the information whether there is an AGN in the host galaxy close by to the supernova, and you can do the, that type of investigation. We haven't done uh, a paper on that with the CTF data. So, all yours. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I have a report on that in the past, but you know, we'll be discussing that a bit later. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Th there is so much to do. The thing here is I'm basically trying to convince you that we have so much data that please um, come and in do crazy things together. But yeah, you have all the data that is shown here all the time. Everything is available.